Geeks and Geek Ets. It's Wednesday morning. Time once again for Ask Chuck Dixon, where you, comic book fans, nerds, geeks, and aficionados of the ninth art, get to ask me, Chuck Dixon, questions about what I do for a living. And what I do for a living is I write comic books. You know the drill. Let's get to it. All right. Jason Manning asks, you've spoken before about writing with an invisible hand such that people stay focused on the story and don't notice the writing itself. Do you think there's something analogous with comic artists? I was recently thinking that some artists are good at getting you to look at Batman and what he's doing versus getting you to stop and admire their drawing of Batman. Yeah, I mean, we all, we all like great comic book art. I mean, it's undeniable. It's one of the reasons we're here. It's one of the reasons you're watching or listening to me right now. Um, you, you like comics. And one of the attractions, obviously, the main attraction, the big attraction, the first thing that draws you to comics are the stunning visuals. You know, they're interesting and engaging and, let's face it, cool. So you're, you're interested in that. And, uh, but there's also a story. You want the story. And you don't want the art to slow things down. Or you don't want the, you don't want to read a series of pinups if you know what I mean. And artists have to be able to draw everything. And there's nothing wrong with the art being beautiful and gorgeous to look at, so long as it doesn't get in the way of the story. And during the image era, we saw the sort of, sort of um, self-indulgence of some of the artists uh, to draw you know, enormous splash pages or enormous double page spreads that really didn't carry the story at all. They were just there as like display pieces. And quite frankly, a lot of those pages were composed to increase their value on the original art market. Uh, I mean, it's no secret. Come on, you artists. <laughs> confess, confess to the sin of wanting to make money off of your original artwork. Uh, I mean, who can blame someone? Um, and I mean, I, 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 sh I have my own little confession. I have, um, I've written splash pages, written quote unquote splash pages, someone else drew them, uh, that I knew I wanted to buy the original of. <laughs> so, there's a dirty little secret. So uh, yeah, so this overindulgence in the art, but, but you have to remember it's a storytelling form. It's not a uh, purely art form, even though the art is the, you know, it's the big attraction. It's, it's, the, sexy, it's the sexy part of comics is, is the art. Um, but you got to tell a story. You got to, uh, not slow the reader down. You've got to pace it out. You've got to give the reader all the information they need. Um, but not too much information so that they're not lingering or, or forget the fact that they're reading a story and just start looking at the pictures because that's not what us comic book writers want you to do. We want you to read the story. Um, an example of this is, is Joe Kubert had a thing he called the big money panel. And um, he would have a, 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 a panel or a page with lots and lots of detail on it uh, that would still stir the story. It would sort of open the story up. It would increase the scale of the story. And he called it the big money panel because he would spend more time on that panel or page uh, than he would normally apportion to a, a, another panel. And uh, that's why I called it, you know, the big money panel. It was the, the big payoff. And, and, but as you can see here, he's drawing your eye to this big image. Uh, it, he, he's, he's doing what the self-indulgent artists are doing, but he's doing it in service to the story, if you can see what I mean. So, uh, yes, there is an invisible hand in, in comic art. And, um, but, you know, it doesn't hurt to slow down and smell the roses every once in a while. <laughs> Joshua Ignatowski, what would you say are the best superhero movies to show first to someone who you're trying to get hooked on the genre? Well, I got to say, looking back over two decades of superhero movies now, um, I got to say Spider-Man 1 and Spider-Man 2 are the ones that I would go to. Um, um, you know, uh, probably my favorite is Iron Man. But if I was introducing someone to the superhero genre, I would go with these two because they're both excellent adaptations, excellent interpretations 
of the original uh, Lee and Ditko stories. Uh, you know, you know, done cinematically, but everything's there. And um, and why I say these are great to introduce to a new audience is because I uh, I remember seeing Spider Man one um, in theater. You know, opening weekend, and theaters packed. You know, it was a huge hit. Monster blockbuster movie. And there comes the scene where Uncle Ben dies. Well, you know, you and I, if you're if you're a comic fan, we all know that story. We've read that story retold a bajillion times. But when Uncle Ben dies, the audience's emotional reaction was visceral. They were shocked. They were saddened. They couldn't believe it. And I'm sitting there going, whoa. The majority of the people sitting here, they don't, they don't, they never heard this story before. They never, they didn't know Spider-Man's origin. These are all newbies sitting here with me. And and for that reason, I say this is and 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 no other superhero movie that I've ever seen had that visceral gut reaction to a scene. So I, I gotta recommend this one strictly on that basis. And another recommendation for Spider-Man number one and two is um my mother-in-law, I mean, at the time she was in her 80s. Uh, she's still with us. Uh, she was in her 80s uh, or, you know, or late 70s when, when Spider-Man 1 and 2 came out. And all of her friends from her uh, retirement village she lives in uh, down here in Florida, uh, they all went to see the Spider-Man movies together. And they loved them. You know, and my mother-in-law, who wouldn't pick up a comic book um, to swat a fly... <laughs> <laughs> she, her and her friends loved the Spider-Man movies. Couldn't wait for the next one. So that gets my recommendation. Whoa! Joshua gets a twin spin. A uh, prestigious award worth absolutely nothing. For people looking to get into reading the Lucky Luke comic, which issues would you advise them to start with and where would you recommend they go from there? Well, I, any Lucky Luke. They're, they're all standalones. They're all... You know, many, many, I'm, I'm, geez, I, I think over 60 of them are available now in English through Cinebook, which I do not get any money from. Uh, I'm always promoting Cinebook because I think it's a terrific company because they're reprinting an awful lot of Belgian and French comics in English for the first time with excellent translations. Um, but any Lucky Luke is good. Uh, and I, I, I would probably start with the ones uh, written by uh, Rene Gassini and, and drawn by Morris. Uh, just because they're they're the classic Lucky Luke, but they're all good. And the the wonderful thing about French comics is that even when they bring on new creators, those new creators uh, stay with what made the characters popular in the first place. Even recent permutations of Lucky Luke that sort of draw it in a somewhat more realistic style stay with the feel and the um, the uh, format and the the framework of the original Lucky Luke. They don't, they don't do what so many um, people in American comics do, which feel like they, they, they feel like they need to turn everything on its head. Uh, they need to, um, you know, tear it down, deconstruct the property uh, in order to find new stories. The, uh, the newer creators on Lucky Luke, and there have been quite a few. I mean, Morris died years ago. Uh, Gassini died years ago. Um, these new creators are are loyal and faithful followers of Lucky Luke, even when they play a little bit with the art style and rest of it. It's all it's all it all has the same uh, sense of humor, uh, you know, sort of blue sky stories, uh, good natured, uh, fun, um, you know, in some cases Western parodies, in other cases Western pastiches. But uh, it's all good stuff. I would start anywhere. Uh, it, it's just a highly recommended series for, you know, just light comic book reading. I, this and Asterix, when you read them, um, there's there's no, uh, you know, it's, it's very clear why these uh, series remain, remain enormously popular uh, throughout Europe. Triple spin, Joshua, look at you. Young kid with a dream. In your opinion, what are the differences between a geek and a nerd? Well, uh, <laughs> we all hear these terms thrown around, and I there's definitely a difference. There's a there's a 
of stark difference between a geek and a nerd. And, you know, the, the, the starkest, starkest example I can think of is, is LARPing, which is a bunch of, you know, fun-loving nerds. These are nerds. It's not geeks. These are nerds. Uh, and you know, I'm not using these as a pejorative. I am a nerd about some things. I am a geek about some things. Uh, I think we all are. You know, it's like, you know, I'm kind of a, of a, of a nerd about Star Trek, but I'm a geek about Doctor Who. So, you know, that kind of thing. If you're already starting to see the distinction, aren't you? Uh, LARPing is a bunch of nerds, and they dress up in, you know, whatever kind of um, sword and sandal outfit, armor, shields, swords, and they go out and, and play at killing one another in medieval fashion. And as you can see here, the, the, the range of periods <laughs> and weaponry and everything else, it spans centuries. Some, some of it even made, looks like it's made up. Uh, it doesn't matter because LARP people just want to go out to the park and, and have a good time and, and fool around and, and play pretend. And that's fine. But, you know, it's deeply, deeply nerdy. Let's all admit it. <laughs> LARPers, you know you're being nerdy. I know you're being nerdy. Nothing wrong with that. It's fun. Everybody's having a blast. Now, the geeks, Civil War reenactors, or any other kind of reenactor, these are geeks. These, you, you can't be out of period. You won't even be allowed on the battlefield if you have the wrong number of buttons on your tunic or you have a weapon that's not in period, or you have a flag that wasn't supposed to be at that battle, you know, if, if your horse's harness isn't in period, you're gone, buddy. You ain't fighting. You ain't welcome here at Gettysburg or Bull Run. <laughs> you're gonna, and it's, um, that's what a geek is. A geek is like deeply, deeply embedded in whatever their interest is. They're, they're not just into it. They're into it they're into it deep and they know everything about it i mean uh when gary quapas and i did the civil war books we ran into this civil war geeks and it, and there's no civil war nerds civil, civil war nerds are not allowed you can't just play around at being interested in civil war you gotta get serious about it you gotta get model railroader serious you gotta get stamp collector serious about civil war reenactment and when Gary and I got into it, we were astounded at the uh, minutia. Uh, you know, guys who were like interested in the second day of Gettysburg between 2.15 <laughs> and 2.45 in the afternoon. I, I kid you not. And they knew everything about those 30 minutes. And that was their f entire focus. And we ran into like a brick wall whenever we tried to appeal to these people because as much research as Gary and I did, it was never enough. And that, my friends, is the difference between a geek and a nerd. And you know, you, you, you would look deep into your heart, look deep into your soul, and you admit you're a nerd about some things, but you're a geek about others. And we're all the same. I'm the same. So again, no pejoratives, no judgments, no judgments here. On to ask Chuck Dixon. Uh, but I will judge you if you don't subscribe. No, no, whatever. Do whatever you want. But I'd love it if you hit the subscribe button. If you already have, thank you. It's helping to build this channel, helping to gain interest and, and bring in more people with more awesome questions. Okay, Jack Elmy. I came across an editorial by Catherine Ironwood. Catherine. <laughs> She'll always be cat to me. Uh, Cat, Cat Ironwood from 1986, which claims that you write your scripts longhand. Is this true? I love your work, whether it's longhand typed or smoke signal. Um, yeah, I, I never learned to type. I still don't know how to type. Uh, thank God for word processing programs, uh, which allow you to make lots of mistakes. They're very forgiving, as all of you know. Um, yeah, I used to write them longhand. Uh, now, I didn't hand them into Cat longhand. I, I, uh, I had a typist. I, a, a friend of mine's sister was a professional typist. And uh, I would, you know, write them out on a legal pad and then send them to her. And, and she would do them up, I think, 50 cents a page at the time. This is 1985. 
And, uh, but <laughs> as I got more and more work, uh, I was doing Airboy, I was doing Seven Sort of Conan, I was starting to do this, starting to do that. Uh, she just gave up. And she said, I can't keep up with you. Because uh, she was doing it part time. She had a full time job as a typist. And this was like extra work. And she said, that's it. I can't. And, I mean, she quit cold turkey. She said, no, I can't. Don't even give me that story. I can't type. I just don't have time. Uh, I'm in a panic. Uh, so I run down to uh, the office supply store. Because there were no computer stores in 1986. <laughs> this is when this, when, when she gave up the ghost was 1986. So I... I go to the office supply store and I walk in and I said, I need a word processing machine <laughs> that I can, I, that I don't need to read a whole lot of directions that I can start working on immediately. That's intuitive. And they sold me a, a brother word processor. I came home, you know, I skimmed through the manual and I was working that very afternoon with lots of frustrations and lots of deletions and lots of cursing and lots of banging on my desktop. Eventually, I learned how to use it in my laser jet printer. Woohoo! Because uh, this is before email, uh, even before faxing. And uh, you actually had to type the stuff up myself, print the stuff up myself, and mail it off. Uh, FedEx. Uh, so, yeah. Long story short, uh, I don't type. Uh, I, I hunt and peck, just like Stephen King. Jason Shepard, Rod Serling, and Gene Roddenberry were masters of injecting commentary on the issues of the day, war, race, religion, sex, into science fiction and fantasy. Serling was quoted as saying, a Martian can say things a Democrat or Republican can't. That's very clever. I like that. I am curious which one you regard as having the greatest impact on popular culture. Um, I just learned recently, Rod Serling and uh, Gene Roddenberry, both World War II vets, I mean, most guys their age were, but they were combat vets. Uh, they actually saw a lot of combat, and uh, which you know affects their world outlook, which affects their work, and certainly gave gravity, I think, to what they wrote. Um, Serling did a lot of social commentary on his show, uh, Twilight Zone. I think ultimately he has the greatest impact uh, because of the way he looked at things. Now, I don't like most of Serling's written episodes. I think they were too preachy or too obvious. Even to me as an adolescent, and you know, as a child, even watching them, they seemed kind of tedious and they were you know, hammering the point home too hard. Uh, I think the most successful of the Serling written episodes were uh, The Monsters Are Coming to Maple Street, which kind of showed, um, exposed what mob mentality is like. Uh, how rumors spread uh, through a neighborhood. And I, I think, um, I mean, I grew up in a suburban neighborhood where th these things would happen, where a rumor would start and it would spread through the neighborhood like wildfire uh, without any proof of anything. And, you know, sometimes it was uh, innocuous things. Uh, but, but still everyone, you know, within a few hours, all believed the same thing, whether it happened or not, you know, with, with no proof, just the, the, the sworn testimony of of someone who said that someone told them uh, someone told their friend something that their cousin saw you know and then boom everybody in the neighborhood knows it so yeah th this was a this was a good episode uh, of Serling that's sort of a social commentary more of a commentary on human nature uh, probably a commentary on paranoia uh, the paranoia of the Cold War era uh, but uh, it was an effective one. But the, but the problem for Serling on Twilight Zone is the episodes we all remember, the episodes we consider classic, the episodes we consider the scariest because they were the best ones, none of them were written by Serling. None of them. Um, Jerome Bixby, uh, Richard Matheson, a few other authors wrote the, 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 the classic episodes, the ones that, you know, scared the crap out of me when I was a kid and, um, you know, gave me nightmares. And, and um, you know, but, but none of them were Serling. Serling, like, concentrated on the social commentary, concentrated on the more, quote-unquote, important stories. Uh, whereas I think most viewers were tuning in to, uh, you know, get the wit scared out of them rather than be, you know, preached to. Um, 
Now, you know, Roddenberry, like I said, also a World War II vet, um, he was a little bit, <laughs> a, a, a little bit more ham-handed in his social commentary. Um, you know, when they did social commentary issues on Star Trek, man, they really just, they just got right in your face with it, uh, kind of, uh, kind of spoiled their own message by making it so obvious and preachy. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking particularly of this episode where uh, the Enterprise comes across a race of people who are black on one side, white on the other, and one side of the planet hates the other because <laughs> on one part of the planet, the people are black on the left side of their face, and on the other part of the planet, they're black on the right side of their face. And, and they, just, they just flogged this issue <laughs> through the episode to, your, you know, you're like, 10 minutes in going, I get it, I get it, I get it, okay, okay. You know, people can be rotten. <laughs> Racism is bad. What a, what a, uh, what a, a, a stunning and brave stance to take. <laughs> I guess they thought it was a brave and stance, take, stance to take in the 60s, but I, I honestly, I lived through the 60s. And I think the public was a little bit ahead of these people, telling them um, how they should act. I think people were already starting to get along. As, as Rodney King suggested we all do. Um, now, a show that really sucked at social commentary was Outer Limits. I love The Outer Limits, but it was an odd show. And if you've ever seen it, it's, it's written in sort of a stilted, pretentious style that, you know, Roddenberry and Serling, they never sunk to this level. Uh, you know, it comes up with some good ideas. It's, it's got some, you know, great stuff. Uh, I, I love the way each episode is filmed. Uh, obviously, it had a, a pretty big budget for a network sci-fi show, and uh, it had some cool stuff. But it was, you know, it was a monster show. To me, it was a monster show. Uh, and every show, you know, almost every episode has monsters or aliens or creatures in it, and that's what I watched it for. And uh, but even in the episodes that were pure monster, scary, chase, adventure kind of things. Even in them, the control voice, which narrated the show, um, would come up with like this totally out of nowhere conclusion, you know, that in, in almost every instance it was, you know, the greatest power in the universe is love. And it's like, where, where, where was that in this episode? <laughs> it's like, it's like the producer said, yeah, okay, this is a, you know, this is a monster show, but we got to put something in there to make it look like, you know, we're, we're not idiots. So they just throw on this sort of little coda at the end of the show. It didn't have anything to do with what went on before. But, uh, yeah, they were the worst. Even I love, again, I love the show. I loved all of these shows, obviously. Twilight Zone, Star Trek, Outer Limits, a uh, big part of my childhood. But um, Outer Limits did it the worst. <laughs> Key and Kurji. Uh, what is a better asteroid hitting the Earth movie, Deep Impact or Armageddon, the more serious one or the more comedic one? Well, Deep Impact um, is my least favorite. Uh, and, and again, just as there is a difference between geeks and nerds, there is a stark difference between these two movies. Deep Impact is largely the, um, the liberal version of the asteroid hitting the Earth story. I was appalled by this movie. And just the just the sheer idiocy of how they presented the story. Um, you know, it's supposed to be a big ass disaster film and that's what everybody's coming to see. And it, it follows exactly the same plot line as Armageddon, you know, a team of guys go out and try to stop the asteroid and they fail. Uh, you know, big government project goes bad. And, and, and then from there, um, you know, the, the, the world tries to decide how to deal with this horrible thing that's happening. And, and they deal with it in, in the way that, you know, I guess Harvard professors would suggest. And uh, they hold a lottery in the United States. And if you win the lottery, you get to go in this, you know, deep sanctuary that the government has dug under the surface of the earth. And hopefully everybody will survive there. But of course, you know, some people don't have to win the lottery. They said there were people who were essential to go down in that hole. And apparently the list of essential people 
was like musicians and public school teachers. <laughs> I mean, I would have excluded public school teachers from the lottery. I was like, here's a, finally a chance to get rid of you people. <laughs> you stay on the surface. And, and they make it public where the sanctuary is going to be. And so, of course, millions of people show up trying to force their way in out in the middle of like this, the Badlands or some desert. And all these people are out there. And the most appalling scene in the movie is uh, when <laughs> we see animals, like, like from Noah's Ark, two of each animal is being brought down to the sanctuary, you know, to try to survive, help them survive, you know, post-asteroid hit, post-extinction event. And, and we see giraffes and zebras. I, think, I mean, are these essential animals? Do they really think that two zebras are going to repopulate the planet with zebras? Zebras aren't native to the United States. It's, it's, it was, and then how much money, time, space, and food that could have saved people uh, were, were, were utilized in order to you know, save two hyenas, um, two orangutans. I mean, wouldn't you like herd cattle and sheep and a whole lot of chickens down into that sanctuary who would be cheaper to keep. Uh, <laughs> it's like the questions raised by this movie are just incredible. And of course, it, like, it, it, it's like a doomsday film with this incredibly dark ending where nothing succeeds and, and we have to assume the human race is annihilated by the end of the film. <laughs> so, and, uh, you know, the asteroid strikes and, and basically everybody dies. And, and the main characters just sort of give up and they just go out and, and stand on the beach and watch the asteroid strike and just, just wait for things to happen. No, and nobody prays. There's no prayer. There's no nothing. You know, it's just the, this is the end of humanity. It dies with a whimper. The only thing the movie had going for it was Taya Leone, uh, who a friend of mine once accurately described as the whole package. <laughs> Uh, Armageddon, Armageddon could not be more different from Deep Impact. It, it's, it's the same story, asteroid heading toward the Earth, but instead of a huge government project uh, and involving NASA, uh, the, the, it's determined that the only people on Earth who have the technology, the know-how, and the, uh, the, the, all, the, you know, the, the, the Yankee know-how to take out this asteroid would be oil rig workers because they're working with basically the same equipment. You know, they work with explosives. They work with drilling. They, they survey. They would know where to place the explosives and how to place the explosives. And so they, they're trained by NASA and Bruce Willis and his, his team are, uh, you know, trained at NASA and, and sent along um, on a space shuttle to go take care of the asteroid because they're Americans. And in everybody's favorite scene in the movie, uh, the oil riggers are just blue collar guys, hard working guys, hard drinking, hard fighting guys, uh, you know, real Americans, real, real, you know, blue blooded American men, you know, the kind of people they don't want to put in movies anymore. Um, the, everybody's favorite scene, I, I would assume, if you've seen this movie, is where they are negotiating terms with the government, because in the end, they are, after all. Uh, you know, working men. You know, what's my paycheck going to look like? And so they're negotiating their pay and everything else. And and Bruce Willis proposes to the government officials. He says one other thing: uh, we don't want to pay income taxes ever. <laughs> and so they got, I I I I joined everyone else in the audience and cheering that line uh, when I saw the movie. So, yeah, it's an entirely different movie. And if you ever see it, if you haven't seen it and, and, and you want to watch it, s skip over all the scenes with Ben Affleck and Liv Tyler. The, uh, the sort of tacked on romance angle just slows the movie down to a crawl and is just cringeworthy every, every frame of it. Uh, so you, you want to avoid that. But, yeah, that's the difference. There couldn't be a bigger difference between these two movies. Um, you know, and, yeah, Armageddon is silly and goofy. It's Michael Bay at his most self-indulgent, but it's still fun. And I like the message and I like the optimism as opposed to the dreary, uh, let, let's give up and just die. Uh, 
uh, ethos of of Deep Impact. But uh, and it's got Bruce Willis. You know, enough said. Kane Door. I've yet to purchase anything from the Ripperverse. I've been watching YouTube and reading your their emails, but that's it. The Horseman will be my first purchase. For those of us who are not familiar with the story universe, what kind of world will the Horseman be operating in? How will this character stand out and be different from the characters already being published in a book somewhere? Well, the, the Horseman is by me and Joe Bennett, and uh, it's kind of funny. I just saw the final finished pencils of the final pages uh, yesterday. Uh, Joe sent them to me. Stunning. Joe's amazing. Um, and the Horseman is... Uh, it, it, it came from um, Joe saying, you know, you know, the Ripperverse needs a, a Batman slash Punisher type character, a, a, a ground level guy without superpowers <clears throat> trying to get along in a, in a world of superheroes. And uh, I thought, well, that's an awesome idea. And so I worked up a scenario of, of who this guy was. And um, <clears throat> he's in the same mass vigilante vein as Batman. He's in the same uh, kind of pissed off blue collar uh guy vein of the punisher but uh with a difference uh he, he his origin is very different uh his uh what he wants is different what drives him is different um but you know you're going to get all the same stuff you're going to get you know uh instant retribution and lots of bad guys getting their heads caved in and shot and thrown off buildings all the things we love about <laughs> masked vigilantes um but you know there's it's I like to think it's got a, a little bit more heart than than Punisher. I, I think this guy's more s- sympathetic and relatable than than Frank Castle. Although for some reason I I relate heavily to Frank Castle, but this guy's um, he, he's lovable. The, the Saska sisters are just they're crazy about this guy. Um, so I, I think you'll enjoy it. The Ripperverse universe is it's like other superhero universes. You know you have. What, we, what we're calling exceptionals or excepts, and, the, and they are the superpowered people, uh, and uh, some of them uh, superpowered by, by birth, mutation, uh, uh, or, or scientific methods. Uh, some of them um, turned into superheroes on purpose by the government. Um, you know, standard superhero fare. I mean, we're not, we're not reinventing the wheel here. But what we, what we, but what we do have is, is a universe with a, an alternate universe from our own reality that has a very different history. It, it gets to where it is in a very different way than, than, than our own history. And a lot of that will be revealed, um, uh, much of it in a project, uh, my next project coming out after The Horseman from Ripperverse, which I can't talk anymore about because Eric loves to keep secrets. Uh, he's, he's, uh, he's a tight-lipped guy who does not like teasing. So, but I'm teasing here. Uh, I am doing a project after the Horseman, which is I've seen pages from stunning. And then Joe Bennett and I have a follow up project coming out right after that, that Joe is starting on uh, next week, uh, which you're going to love, which is in a different sort of vein, a different area of the superhero genre. But uh, I, I think you'll dig it. And as I said to Joe, as successful as the Alpha Core campaign was, I think the Horseman campaign is going to be even bigger because um, I think the Horseman's got a lot of appeal. And I think uh, once you see some of the pages, they're just mind-blowing. Joe, Joe is um, that rare mix. Uh, I talked earlier about um, the invisible hand of an artist. He's that rare mix of a guy who is just an amazing draftsman, just an amazing artist. He, he, creates these mind-boggling images, but he is so damn good at storytelling. I mean, he is he is a student of cinema, and he really gets it. There, I, I've, I've done very few action scenes um, that flow the way, when he blocks them out, they just flow perfectly, just like a movie on paper. Uh, you know, Rodolfo DiMaggio, uh, Graham Nolan can do it. You know, a lot of guys can't. Uh, but, but, you know, just, just beautiful, beautiful stuff. Uh, I think you're going to love it. Uh, RB Probst. You've mentioned page rates in several episodes now. This got me thinking when you were at companies where you were doing both ongoing monthly work and one-off work, miniseries, one-shots, et cetera, 
Did your page rate apply equally across the board or did you have a page rate for your monthly work and separate page rate specific for your one off work? Um, no, I had a, I had a page rate, what they call in the movie business, your quote. I had a rate at Marvel. I had a rate at DC and it didn't matter what I was working on. The, uh, if it was Scooby-Doo or Batman, I, I got the same rate. Uh, now I understand that in later years, like on, uh, some of the, like the kids line stuff, they lowered that rate. So you had to take a lower, but I, I didn't write any kids stuff for DC in that period. I, I don't, I don't think Marvel did the same thing. The only time your page rate changed is if you did a special project and, um, I mean, I wrote a um, uh, a comic book, uh, Superman Meets NASCAR. Uh, that was a special project done for Kmart. And I wrote um, a, a Batman story for a, uh, a handout at Six Flags Great Adventure. Uh, they would give you a, a booklet with a map in it, and it was a new Batman ride. And so they had me do a, a Batman comic, like, a, like an eight-pager uh, and so the map was actually in a comic book and uh, they would pay rate and a half. So whatever my rate was, I would get 50% more for a special project because there were no royalties on the special projects. I wish there were because man, that Superman NASCAR book sold big time, it sold with a NASCAR t-shirt. They sold a ton of them. And on the six flags, I think they printed like 10 million of them. And boy, the royalties on that would have been sweet. I'd probably have a, a, a house in the Bahamas. Uh, but anyway, um, and, uh, and the special projects were always fun. Uh, Paul Kupperberg was always the editor on special projects, and he was always so much fun to work with. And I remember particularly Scott Beatty uh, wrote a, uh, a, a, a Batman animated comic for Mucinex, that was hysterically funny. <laughs> uh, Scott couldn't get all his best jokes to move, but it was, they were just fun to work on. Just sort of, you know, they were sort of like writing, you know, hostess pie ads. Just sort of having goofy fun with the superheroes. But yeah, that's the only time the page rates would change. Otherwise it was blanket rate. Uh, today, my rates depend on who I'm working for. I negotiate up and down, uh, lower page rate if I get back end. Uh, higher page rate if I, there's no back end, and uh, so on and so forth. Gentle Savage, Mr. Dixon, are you a fan of any board games or card games? If so, which one? Well, when I was a kid, I played a lot of board games. My favorites were Dogfight, which was a, a World War I aviation game. Um, you play that out on the front stoop. And uh, this was during the, the World War I aviation, the inexplicable World War I aviation craze of the 1960s. And uh, just played the hell out of this game. And another one often played on the front stoop or at the dining room table was uh, Stratego, sort of uh, dumbed down chess for kids. And uh, I dug this game hours and hours and hours. And of course, you know, Monopoly and a bunch of the others. But Stratego and Dogfight were, were my go-tos. Uh, when we were tired of playing dogfight, we play Stratego uh, and, and back and forth. Um, now, I'm not, I don't play a lot of board games now. My son, my youngest son is really into board games. I mean, really into board games. So uh, usually on holidays, uh, we'll spend some time playing Catan. Uh, but he's got, man, he must have like 100 board games uh, and, and, and has, you know, has a circle of friends that play. And, and everything else. Uh, recently, he and I drove from Pennsylvania to Florida, and we stopped at a bunch of board gaming places, board game stores, which I didn't know existed, uh, all the way down to Florida. We stopped at like, you know, two or three of them. And uh, man, if you're ever in Annapolis, Third Eye Games and Third Eye Comics, man, you got to go there. Those places are like Walmarts for this stuff. Uh, just amazing. I, I usually never, I, I usually walk out of a comic shop buying nothing. I think I dropped a grand at Third Eye because uh, they had stuff I'd never seen before. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not really that into board games or video games or anything like that. 
uh, these days, but I will, you know, I'll play Catan. It's fun. It's challenging. And um, I, I, I enjoy it most when my wife wins. <laughs> Dan Perrin, as a fellow collector of original art, primarily commissions, I'd love to hear more about your original art collection. How many pieces do you have? Are they mostly from work you've done? What are your top three? And are any displayed? Um, yeah, I display stuff in my office. And then in my son's, my youngest son has a whole bunch of art hanging in his room because I don't have as much wall space as I used to. Uh, my office is much smaller than, than it used to be. <clears throat> I had an office in Pennsylvania that was like a wing of the house. Uh, today I'm in uh, what they what they uh, generously here in Florida call a den. It, it's, it's more like a walk-in closet. But anyway, yeah, I mean, uh, <clears throat> I have some pieces. Yeah, primarily my collection is stuff that was gifted to me by artists that I worked with. Uh, Alcatena gave me this pitch piece for Detective Comics Annual Number 7, which was turned into the cover. Uh, in addition, he gave me three other pitch pieces, uh, one each for Catwoman, Robin, and the Joker. And, uh, yeah, well, obviously, I love this piece. It's gorgeous. Um, one of my earliest pieces was uh, Hilary Barda gave me this at a Chicago con, one of the first ones I went to. And uh, I'd asked him to draw me a picture of Plastic Man, uh, you know, and he did this you know, beautiful, beautiful piece. Uh, Plastic Man and Woozy, and I think that's Hillary in the background surfing. Uh, and I treasure that. <clears throat> it hangs on my office wall. I can turn my head right now and see it. Uh, another one gifted to me was uh, Ernie Cologne was running late on uh, his Airboy arc. <laughs> and in order to bribe myself and Bo Smith not to uh, complain about it, uh, he sent us uh, covers, original covers. And this is, a, this is a painting. This is like color pencils and dyes. And uh, it's huge. It's, it's drawn much bigger than a normal comic book cover. And uh, it's a little more square. There's a lot of cut off. There was a lot cut off when they did the, uh, the cover itself. And uh, again, I can, I can turn my head and see it right now. It's a beaut. Uh, Rodolfo DiMaggio uh, GCPD cover. I think I have two covers from this series. Uh, inked by Bill Sienkiewicz. Uh, I got a lot of Rodolfo artwork. I was always asking him for stuff or he was always sending me stuff. Uh, he was very, very generous uh, giving away artwork, which he shouldn't have been. Stuff's worth money. He didn't seem to care about that. Um, a, a cover uh, I'm, I'm looking at right now. It's uh, Graham Nolan, Detective Comics cover. Uh, one of my favorite covers that Graham, my second favorite Detective Comics cover Graham ever did. I mentioned to him how much I love this cover, and he sent it to me. And uh, very generous. Thank you, Graham. And a, you know, I got a lot of Graham in my collection because we've worked together so many times. Uh, you know, a lot of Graham, a lot of Gary Quapis because of the length of time we, you know, worked together. Uh, this is a uh, Punisher um, War Journal cover featuring uh, Payback and Lynn Michaels, the female Punisher. Both characters I created as drawn by Michael Golden. Uh, I, um, I bought this cover off of uh, John Dell, the inker, while we were at CrossGen. He was trying to raise money to buy a, a complete Michael Golden Wolverine story. He wanted to buy the whole story, and he was trying to raise money. So uh, I, I, bought this, I bought this page, I bought this cover from him. I'm very glad I did. I, I love this cover, and I love the fact that it features two characters I created by you know, Michael Golden, for God's sake. Uh, this is a piece I just bought on a whim back in the 90s when I was buying a lot of original art. It's uh, John Byrne. It's a Superman and Batman, a uh, particular version to go with a, uh, a Kenner toy that was being released. It was, a, it was a special comic book drawn by John with uh, special action figures with different accoutrements than they usually have. And I just thought it was a cool piece, classic. It's John Byrne. It's uh, Superman and Batman. Why not? Uh, another piece by T.K. Alcatena. It's a, uh, I did a lot of these where I, I, I put two pages together. It's a two-page continuity from a what if we did. Uh, what if the new Fantastic Four had, had remained? And I, I love this page because it's got the Sinister Six on it, and it ends with a gag about Herbie the robot. So I uh, had to have it. I said, Kike, please, I need those pages. Um, 
another KK piece, which I absolutely adore. I treasure this piece. This was a pitch piece for an Elseworlds Viking Batman that got rejected. Uh, an Icelandic saga featuring Batman. And um, they said, no. Can you believe it? Look at this art. Can you believe they turned this down? Uh, and Kike, um, he, he had sent me the pitch piece to take to DC so they could see the original. And when we were done, he says, you know, you, you, you can keep the original. I'm eternally grateful. Thank you, Kike. Here's two more pieces. Michael Golden, it's my very first um, issue of Detective, covered by Michael Golden. I bought it from Michael Golden, and he made me promise, he made me sign a letter saying I would take this page to my grave, that I would never sell it. And I never did, Michael. There it is. It's framed, hanging on the, my, my son's wall. Uh, next to it is a Green Arrow page by, again, Rodolfo DiMaggio that I really like, featuring our uh, Wear Jaguar character, which I think you know Rodolfo just knocked out of the park. Uh, big, scary beast guy. Uh, another John Byrne piece. I love John Byrne's work on Namor. And I, I bought these two pages. They're two continuity pages because uh, I, I just dig the storytelling. You know, I like the art. I like the storytelling. Um, two, two page continuity from Graham Nolan. I just dig the big figures on this page and it's Bane. So I said, you know, Graham, I, I got to have those pages. And uh, he gave me a good price. <laughs> he might have given them to me. I don't know. Uh, he gave me, he's given me a lot of artwork. Graham's been very, very generous over the years sharing his artwork. And I always appreciate it because, um, you know, I'm not one of those writers. I'm very shy about asking for artwork. I remember telling John Romita Jr. I said, I want to, I want a page from our, Pun our Punisher Warzone arc. And he said, oh, I'll give you one. I said, no, 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 John, I want to buy one because, if you give me one, you'll give me a crappy page. <laughs> but if I buy one, I can get a good one. And he thought that was fun because uh, it's true. Uh, <laughs> but um, but I, I generally don't ask for pages uh, unless I'm like a friend with a person or I have some sort of a you know uh, personal relationship with them. And uh, even then, I offer to buy it. You know, but but most often they just say, "No, you, 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 I, I'll give you the page." So. Uh, Another one I treasure is uh, I have several Alex Toth pieces uh, or Toth pieces. Uh, this is my favorite. It's a uh, it's the first and last page of um, of a creepy story from Creepy uh, called The Stalkers, and I dug this story so much when I was a kid. And I bought these pages I think twenty years apart. I think the first page cost me fifty bucks. <laughs> And the, the last page cost me like 750 bucks. So today, I don't know what they're worth. I don't care what they're worth. I'm not into it for that. Hey, one more thing. Uh, actually, I should go back and, and explain. And I have other artwork. I have artwork in folders and stuff like that. I've, I've had so many people be generous and give me stuff that you know, I've got folders of stuff. I've, I've got a lot of Russ Heath art that I bought myself. Uh, and I'll tell you one thing, if I knew back then, back in the 70s, what I know now, I would have worked three jobs and spent all the money buying original artwork. Because back then you could buy Kirby pages for 35 bucks. Uh, I would have just bought artwork. I would have become an art, original art dealer and, and held on to some stuff. And I, and, I, and I have that island of the Bahamas today. Not just a house, I'd have a whole island. Uh, because this stuff is like increased in value. I mean, screw IRAs. Um, you know, buy original art. Well, not now because the prices are ridiculously high. You can't touch the stuff. But back in the day when a guy making minimum wage could still buy original artwork now and then, I should have bought a whole lot more. Okay, one more thing. Uh, I got a question a number of weeks ago about alternatives to putting the stuff in cardboard boxes. Uh, and, I, and I talked about the... Uh, Starlight show-offs that I use that aren't made anymore, and I'm always looking for alternatives. And I, you know, to I mean, these are great. They're perfect. They're perfect comic book size, as you can see, and uh, they keep that uh, you know pulpy comic book smell, which so many people say they like. I don't. I have sinus problems, <laughs> uh, so uh, I'd rather they were hermetically sealed where I can't. My closet doesn't smell like um, a pulp mill. Um, 
but these aren't available anymore. The Starlight doesn't make them. So I found, I saw these at Sam's Club. I thought I'd recommend these to you all because I care about your comics. I don't want them to rot away and, uh, and have those ugly long boxes, uh, you know, those cardboard boxes in your closets. So uh, these are a, bigger than comics, but they're, they seal, they're airtight, and uh, they're clear, so you can look inside them. And uh, they seem pretty good. They're like, just like standard file boxes, but as you can see, they're kind of reinforced. They're very sturdy. Uh, you can probably stack these five or six high and uh, no problem. So uh, I thought I would suggest it. They are the Stacker Stacking Storage Box. And I saw them at Sam's Club. Yes, Chuck, mention where you saw them, not just that you saw them. I saw them at Sam's Club, and they were a pretty good price, and they would hold up a crap ton of comics, wouldn't they? Hey, Levon's back. Levon Scourge, book 12 of the Levon Cade series, Vigilante Justice, shooting and killing and punching and chasing and all kinds of crazy stuff as Levon travels across two continents uh, in order to uh, hunt down the men who are threatening his family and, and get rid of them once and for all. So uh, if you want to check that out, you head on over to Amazon. It's on Kindle. It's in paperback. It'll be on audio very, very soon. And that's it for me this week. I want to thank you for watching. I want to thank you for listening, subscribing, liking, spreading the word. And I'll see every single one of you, I hope, down the road.